TWIM stands for Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. The TWIM method uses metta, loving kindness, as the basis for the development of the unification of mind, jhanas, and insights leading to awakening. The unique thing about TWIM is that it uses what the Buddha originally taught by combining various elements from other contemplative CrossFit exercises, such as mindfulness, vipassana, and do-nothing meditation, while using metta, the feeling of loving-kindness, as the object of meditation. It is the practice designed around right effort to find the middle way, the perfect merging and transcendence of contraction and expansion between practice and non-practice, effort and effortlessness. In the original sutra, the Buddha spoke frequently about the jhanas and loving-kindness. Why? Because he realizes that all the mind wants is to be happy. So jhanas are the cultivation of tranquility and ultra states of consciousness to understand the mind through direct experience. In this video, we're going to take a look at the different kinds of cravings and their roots, the twin technique instructions, handling dark nights and addictions, how to access jhanas or samadhi through relaxation versus concentration, the mechanics, progression, and the phenomenology of these jhanas from 1 through 8, ending with a cessation, how that relates to loving kindness to produce insights into the nature of mind and reality to eradicate suffering. What exactly are jhanas or samadhis? What is the deathless? What is the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the unconditioned? and the importance of not taking the path too seriously for the most optimal gains. I follow you since like uh, 2012. A couple of years ago, you took all this uh, spiritual trip. Mind blowing, man. The Buddha never really taught too much about like hardcore concentration on the breath, like dissolving the breath into particles and then into like empty space, like drilling down the sensation like we do in Vipassana. Instead of what Buddha meant when he said mindfulness, it's more like just a collected, tranquil, Equanimous mind, and then just to yeah. kind of not even concentrate on that, but just be aware, sink into that feeling of loving kindness. Buddha figured out like this might be the best way to get people into certain states of consciousness. In the world of samsara, we are looking for happiness in worldly pleasures. Why not replace the mind's intrinsic need for joy with altered states of consciousness? like jhanas and the feeling of loving-kindness. So jhanas are almost like a rehab center for the mind. Cultivation of jhanas, in a way, it's for you to cultivate a kind of bliss. But then you're just using that as a tool. The, the Buddha have said, you know, it's the, the goal is not the jhanas. Like he's visited all these masters, all those Brahmins who have access like all jhanas and they're like sitting in like the seven jhana all day long. But, he thinks they're still clinging on to something. There's still there's still a little bit of suffering in there, there's some identification there. So and that's another insight into impermanence. Like not even awareness or consciousness is permanent. By temporarily transferring the attachments to worldly pleasures, to the jhanas, and the feeling of loving kindness, we can use it as catalysts to gain insights into the nature of mind and reality and to dissolve hindrances, resistance, and contractions that get in the way of recognizing our true nature. So I think the most direct way to recognize the nature of mind is to let go. Right? See, control is an illusion. So by trying to suppress or control your desires, it simply leads to more cravings, tensions, and more desires. So with this practice or any kind of spiritual practice, the goal is not to suppress anything, but simply observe and let go and let nature unfold through the course of the least resistance. So the jhanas I'm going to be talking about here occurs naturally as a byproduct of a delightful and relaxed mind. When a mind is joyful, it softens and relaxes, and tensions and cravings will be dissolved. See, the Buddha did not speak a lot about one-pointed concentration to the breath because of the unnecessary tightening that can be created by forcing your mind to concentrate on a specific point of the meditation object where you risk creating more tensions and cravings and ultimately reinforces the meditator. So the difference between relaxation type jhanas and absorption type is that in the former, you're letting the jhanas occur naturally. 
In the latter, you use that one pointness, hardcore concentration power to cultivate a certain state, which can create more tensions and cravings that reinforces the subject object split. It can be sitting in the absorption for hours and hours on end, and the moment you get off the cushion, you go right back into habitual tendencies. So the different access point to jhanas, but I think in general, in jhana gains to relaxation, and loving kindness is a lot quicker. It's also easier to become a jhana junkie through the absorption type because you're actually striving for something rather than relaxing and letting go. But which type of jhana you need depends on your genetic wiring, where you are on the path, and your practice history. But either way, jhanas in and themselves don't lead to liberation. They're simply the byproduct of the dissolution of conditioning and defilements until you reach the unconditioned. And we're going to go into details on how this happens later. But after non-duality, it's actually quite difficult to jhana. If everything's already boundless and holographic, there's nothing to expand or dissolve. So the paradox about the jhana is that if you're still experiencing the dissolution of the body, or the body uh, expanding and contracting, it presupposes that the body is still solidified, and you're still holding on to the belief of a physical body. If you're still experiencing the expansion of space and consciousness, it means you haven't seen through space and time as the artifacts of the mind, and you still take consciousness to have an inherent existence. Practice in jhanas can also cultivate energy to make radiance gains. When the body mind starts to dissolve, it releases a tremendous amount of energy, and one can utilize this energy to penetrate even more solidity in a feedback loop of dissolution and penetration. The feeling of loving kindness also stabilizes the mind in a feedback loop of joy, samatha, and expansion. When all the blockages are cleared out, there's simply this dynamic flow of the universe fucking itself raw without a condom. And just like how if you max out vipassana and do nothing meditation, you end up the same fill in the blank. Relaxation and absorption jhanas ultimately serve the same end. But even in relaxation jhanas, there's still a very diffuse form of focus. You're attending to a feeling as a catalyst to collect and rest the mind before letting that go. Instead of using the absorption of the mind to cultivate one-pointed concentration, the Buddha recommended a much softer and lighter approach, where instead of concentration, the words from the Pali Canon to describe mindfulness is a collected mind, a stabilized mind, a tranquil mind that is softer and more elastic and spacious. And a catalyst, again, for this tranquil mind is joy and loving kindness. You know, the Buddha is a cheeky cunt. You know, he realizes that the most efficient way to get people to see deep insights into the nature of mind is to have fun while you're doing it. When the mind is delighted during practice, the progression is a lot more rapid. The mind spontaneously focuses and stabilizes itself. You know, awareness becomes much quicker. You know, it is a serious path, but you don't have to be serious. You create this tightening around expectations. I'm not a Buddhist, so I'm not advocating the twim technique as the king of all meditation practices. Twim, like all spiritual practices, is simply a tool, a raft. When you use that raft to sail across the river, let it go and move on. To start the practice of Twim, find a place to sit quietly with your spine straight and close your eyes. Send warm wishes to yourself by repeating the following phrase several times while imagining a cute animal or a baby smiling at you in order to elicit the feeling of loving kindness. May I be happy. May I be free from suffering. May I be well. Feel the warm wishes in your heart and chest area and let it grow and expand. Unify your mind around this feeling in a collected and spacious way. This is your object of meditation. Then send the warm wishes to others by repeating the following phrases several times. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from suffering. After a while, you'll notice that simply setting the intention for loving kindness is enough. There is no need to keep repeating the phrases as more verbalization can create unwanted contractions. You simply abide in the warm feeling of loving kindness until distractions, hindrances, resistance, and tension arise. The Buddha statues are often depicted with a serene, peaceful smile. Put that smile on your face, in your heart, on your eyes, and in your mind. Use the 6R method to handle any distractions that may arise. 
The first R is recognize. The second R is release. The third R is relax. The fourth R is re-smile. The fifth R is return. The sixth R is repeat. One, recognize that attention has drifted away from the meditation object and is caught up in hindrances and distractions. Two, release your attachment to the distracting thought or sensation by simply letting it be and withdrawing attention from it. Let go of the grasping of your attention to the object of distraction. When you stop feeding the distraction with attention and energy, it will dissipate on its own. Three, relax any remaining tightness and tension in the body, heart, and mind caused by the distraction. Four, re-smile. Restore the small smile to your lips, your eyes, and your heart, and with it the happy feeling of loving kindness. Five, return your attention back to the meditation object, the feeling of loving kindness. Six, Repeat this series of steps whenever the mind becomes distracted and loses its meditation object. To simplify things, using the first four R's may be enough. When in doubt, apply the law of drops. Don't resist or push, soften and smile. Each time you run through the four R's, the mind becomes more purified, more unified, more equanimous. As you go deeper and deeper into more and more subtle layers of the mind to clean up the defilements hidden below consciousness. This is how you bring the unconscious to the conscious, the shadow to the light. The more defilements you dissolve, the more spacious awareness becomes. And this is how you enter into deeper jhanas, eventually reaching a cessation. The recognized part is where the mindfulness is. You want to use a unified and collective mind to do the recognition. You're not trying to contract your direction of attention to that which you're trying to recognize. Just notice where the contraction is and then you, you release. There can be a different spectrum of release too. You could go in there and apply like microscopic vipassana with as little effort as possible and release that contraction like that, Dissol almost like dissolving it. Or you can simply let the direction of attention or the contraction be there without interfering with it. And then the relaxation part, they say, is one of the most important part, actually. You can see that even the act of releasing, whether that's recognizing and just let it be there or going in there and releasing it, there's still a tiny bit of effort in there. So then you just totally relax, like just go to your body, mind, and then whatever tension is there left when you're, quote unquote, done releasing, the direction of attention, the contraction in, in the thought or in the emotion, all that would start to sizzle away, including the effort to try to relax or release, including the effort to try to do two will sizzle away. And the ultimate relaxation is you can't do any of that. It's just happening by itself. Same thing as we talked about last week with the do nothing meditation. So, and then they re-smile. And they repeat. And each time you run through the four R's, hopefully you are going deeper and deeper into the subconscious or even into the conditioning and then releasing more subtle and subtle contractions and on and on and on. The first noble truth, there is Dukkha in life. Dukkha comes from craving. So they say that there's three types of craving. It could be sensual craving. And then there's being craving, which is for continued existence, for longevity, for just uh, abide in a certain very positive state and then there's even craving for non-being I'm gonna annihilate myself then no more existence but that's still craving that's craving for non-being like if you look at my stages of awakening you know I have like the, the, the ego state the witness state and then like the God consciousness Brahman state and then nothingness state so the, the Brahman state could you can easily be sucked into the craving for existence or some kind of a absolutism or eternally existing kind of framework yeah and then uh you go into the nothingness phase and there's craving for not existing there craving for nothingness so the buddha learned that when he was like visiting the aesthetics and he was like okay all those people are just craving for non-existence the buddha never taught no self but he never taught the self either it's very easy for like people who are into buddhism to get stuck in the no self land 
craving is just a physical, experiential, tensional contraction. Especially a contraction of the direction of attention. Why are you craving this beautiful woman on the street or hamburger out there? It's because the direction of attention is contracted to the object in perception, right? Your attention is going there, right? And that's what's causing the craving. And the attention that's grasping the object points back to the subject, reinforces it. And that's how the subject-object duality is created. Why are you lost in thought? Because in that moment, the direction of attention are contracted over those thoughts. Craving, it doesn't matter what you're craving. All it matters is that you see through the direction of attention in the mind. Usually it's attention of a contract somewhere in the head. Whether you're, right. whether you're like contracted to an object out there or something in here or even holding onto a sensation of bliss or something like that. Your direction of attention is going to that sensation of bliss. So just to release that direction of attention, release that contraction in the direction of attention, is pretty much the only thing you have to do. The only thing you have control over on this entire path is your attention. But even though ultimately when you even see through the, out the direction of attention, it's just happening by itself. But that's right. the, you know, the, the ultimate insight into non doership But during the path, the only thing you can really do is quote unquote manipulate your direction of attention or in twin, letting go of the direction of attention. So like I said, you can have like 10 chocolate cakes without craving and be totally present without contracting your direction of attention. And after you eat the chocolate cake, there's no craving for that to exist. There's no craving for more chocolate cake. There's a lot of craving. If you do the Vipassana the way that most people do, or I did for a while, which is just going hardcore. Like instead of just relaxing, why you do the Vipassana or let the body scan itself? And the Goenka even mentioned a lot of like equanimity, but a lot of people overlook that. When they're scanning, they just try really hard to like, either dissolve their entire body, craving for like the dissolution of the body, or craving to like hit every single sensation, dissolve every single sensation in emptiness. Oh, I can't miss a spot. That becomes a kind of a craving. If you use craving to try to solve craving, you're going to lead to more craving, right? Like I think they use an example of an alcoholic, right? If you tell an alcoholic not to drink, if he's like trying really hard not to drink, there's like, which one is the real self? The one that tries to not drink or the one that is craving to drink more? That's the question for you to contemplate. But even just like trying really hard to not drink, that's a kind of a craving. They haven't addressed the root problem. AA people, like if you're still counting, then they're still craving. As long as they get out the 12 day program, so many cases of them just like, you know, just go off the rail. You know, you're just suppressing your craving and then replacing that with another craving. Even like the witness stage, a lot of people get into mindfulness and then they will start witnessing their thoughts. But the witness, there's still some contraction there. And you watch the breath really hardcore, you're creating a witness to do that. So if your object of meditation is on a quality of experience, now instead of like just like a single point object, then it's easier for the mind to not focus on any specific object particularly, but just as a more like a unified sense of samatha. Because the feeling is pretty abstract, abstract, right? I think the cultivation of metta is very, very powerful because the juice of the metta, the feeling of loving kindness, using that to dissolve the cravings is in some ways more effective than just using a very neutral space of awareness. So adding the compassion aspect, the self-love aspect of acceptance, it's like a steroid to the solution. And then you let go of that, and then yeah. eventually and then you realize... Yeah. dispassion. Yeah. The dispassion. Dispassion, yeah. Compassion is dispassion. Right? So it's when you let go of even like bliss, joy, compassion, that's when you, you can truly become compassionate. Someone asked Daniel Ingram what the best method is to deal with dark night of the soul. He's like, uh, play better. So using Twim as a practice reduces the chance of you uh, running into a severe dark night. And Twim is also one of those practices that you can do off the cushion very easily. In fact, you may continue to do the things you have cravings for and turn that into your practice. And this is what Tantra is all about, right? You're transforming the afflicted into wisdom. Somebody asked Osho, you know, how do I stop smoking? And his reply was, keep on smoking, but just apply presence because awareness itself is curative. And Twim is just a more systematic way to do that. Don't crush mind with the mind. Apply the four R's, whatever tensions arise, while you're doing the things that will trigger you or give you craving. I think that's one of the most direct ways to purify the mind right on the spot. Let the vast spaciousness of awareness or love dissolve whatever doesn't serve you and transform the unwholesome into the wholesome. This is the mechanism of integrating realization to every aspect of your life. Now let's run through the jhanas one through eight. First you write that feeling of metta, you know, loving kindness, loving kindness. Once you start to get the feeling already, you just write it through the jhanas. At first, you're going to feel the tingling sensation of loving kindness in the chest area, like a physical buzzing excitement. 
This is the first jhana, and excitement is replaced by joy as you enter the second jhana. You enter the third jhana when loving kindness starts to spread across the entire body. The mind becomes quieter, more stabilized, and tranquil as the body begins to dissolve. The fourth jhana, you can experience a full body dissolution. Starting with the fifth jhana of infinite space, the feeling of loving kindness is dissipated and spread across the space all around you. You might feel like you've expanded to the whole room and beyond. Now, this is when loving kindness and joy begins to be replaced by equanimity. So you move from one jhana to the next by resting the mind there until it becomes disenchanted. The mind will grow quote unquote bored and dissatisfied when it realizes that whatever experience it is having, and no matter how blissful or spacious, it still yet more fabrications. And then you let go of some more. So the five elements are earth, water, fire, space, air, and consciousness. And this dissolution from solidity to liquid to air and beyond is exactly the progression of the jhanas. If there are no distractions, the feeling of loving kindness will grow and expand to your entire body as it dissolves into this radiance. This is the fourth jhana. Let this energy grow and expand to encompass the space around your body. Then send and expand the feeling of loving kindness in all six directions, from your head and around the body to encompass the whole universe without any boundaries or separations. This will bring you to the fifth jhana of infinite space. You may feel like you are floating and levitating. Use the six R method to handle any distractions that arise. Otherwise, continue to expand the sphere of loving kindness. The sixth jhana occurs when the expansion is maxed out so the attention is shifted to the content that is arising and passing away within this infinite field. You enter the seventh jhana of nothingness when the space and its content that is arising and passing away slows down to become one seamless nothing. You'll receive the insight that awareness is not different from sensations. Form is no different than emptiness. The world is Brahman. Both consciousness and its content are the fabrications of the mind. Remain in the evenness of this field of nothingness until you reach max effort equanimity. Use the 6R method whenever hindrances arise. You enter the 8th jhana, neither perception nor non-perception, when even equanimity and nothingness is let go of. This is where even awareness and perception start to dissolve and you reach a state that is neither conscious nor not conscious, neither dreaming nor awake. When you practice entering the eighth jhana, you rewire the brain into accepting paradoxes by letting go of dualistic thinking as neither this nor that. It's important to keep letting go of any subtle sense of a direction of attention. Do not pay attention to anything. There is nothing you can do here. Nowhere to go, nothing to become. Let go of even letting go until you reach Niroda, the cessation of feeling, perception, and consciousness. As you go deeper into the jhana, you're letting go of more and more fabrication, more and more fabrication, right? Like we use the word fabrication a lot, right? But that's another way to see through emptiness is how everything is fabricated. Emptiness just means everything is constructed. So when you're in like the first jhana, there's still a lot of fabrication. In the nothingness phase, it's like there's very little fabrication there. Eighth jhana, neither perception nor non-perception is like even the fabrication or perception itself or consciousness itself starting to break down. You're neither perceiving nor not perceiving. You're neither aware nor not aware. And then, as you write that even more, you go into a cessation. Well, a cessation is a state where there is no fabrication. When you don't have fabrication, you don't even have consciousness. Because then that's also when you start to get the insight that even consciousness or awareness is conditioned. Not even awareness or consciousness is permanent. Now, the seventh genre of nothingness is the signless pure awareness. 
but there's still an object there, right? Which is nothingness, which means that the subject is still present because one cannot exist without the other. And you get the insight that subject and object dependent on each other are co arising, and that the conditionality that is attention is what's holding them together. One of the key hallmarks of the eighth jhana, neither perception or non perception, is kind of like a physical TV screen that's about to be shot off. But you can sense them fitting in and out of existence as you continue to let go and unhook the tiny links of dependent origination and the subtlest attention that's holding your reality together. This part of the process can feel like you're dying, right? There's nothing you can do here. Reality will let go of you when you stop holding on to existence or non existence. Then you reach a cessation. Now, I emphasized way too much on cessations before. It's the Olympic gold medal of meditation, sure, but it's just a tool. But you can use any other tool to stay inside into impermanence, not self, and emptiness. See, you want to rewire the brain almost at the hardware level to perceive experientially that time, space, and consciousness are not the container or the source of causes and conditionings, but they themselves are part of the webs of conditionality, therefore empty of inherent existence. So, what is the ground of reality? There is none. So when you come out of cessation, you see that everything you defabricate starts to come back online. Okay, perceptions start to come back, sensations come back, consciousness comes back. Yeah, and then all those fabrications start to come back. Yeah. So the unconditioned state is really no different than the conditioned state. Don't interfere with this conditionality. You don't create more condition around the, the, the webs of conditionality of the universe. That's another insight, that there's no agency to control it outside of this webs of cause and condition. You can't step outside of it. The only thing you can do is disappear into it, or just be okay with it. That's another way to put it. So there is no like unconditioned per se that exists outside of the matrix in this transcendental realm behind the curtain. Because if there is, there is still a duality between reflection and mirror, right? This is it, nirvana is samsara. The absolute is the relative, the unmanifested is the manifested. So the goal is to be in the world, but not out of the world. So at first, you realize the infinite space of awareness and watch how thoughts, sensations, bodies, and the whole world are arising in and out of it. This is the realization of I amness, or unbounded consciousness, or pure presence, or oneness, but that's not not self yet. Then you realize that because the content is empty, this awareness is also empty because the two are never separated from each other, and the codependent writes, This is the insight into anatta. Seeing through the emptiness of presence just makes everything more vibrant and panoramic. Not only that everything is consciousness, but that there is no consciousness per se besides the manifestation of whatever it is that is heard, seen, sensed, touched, cognized, and smelled. Not only is there no thinker, no hearer, no seer, no doer, in thinking just thoughts, in hearing just sounds, and in the seeing just forms, shapes, and colors. Where infinite reflections without a source or a mirror are beautiful. <laughs> you can say that source is appearance. Dancing without background or foreground, movement or non-movement, direction or non-direction. In Chinese, nirvana means absolute rest, right? So it feels like you're completely still at all times, yet everything is dynamic as fuck, right? You've never gone anywhere, yet the whole universe is infinite shape-shifting. Now, without the emptiness inside, it's very easy to cling on to awareness as a big self, or rarefy yourself into a creator and develop a god complex. Now, one way to lock in this insight experientially in the context of Twim is to defabricate and refabricate the mind over and over again until the rising and passing happen simultaneously, until you deconstruct the nature of all experiences from the most divine to the most mundane and see exactly how they're constructed in exactly the same way. So the natural state is the unfabricated fabrication, <laughs> but if everything is a fabrication, then nothing is. So what they call the unfabricated state of Nibbana is simply experiencing the fabrication that is this reality and its purest state without any identification, grasping, resistance, obscurations, or ignorance. Because the ignorance about the nature of mind or reality being empty is what solidifies things into categories and separations that creates clinging and suffering. Whether that's concepts and language, or the solidification of a body or a self, or the identification to consciousness, it's all the same thing. So the last four jhanas are called the formless jhanas because they're a less solidified state than you know, the first four jhanas. And psychedelic experiences too. The reason why walls are breathing and things are morphing and penetrating each other is because in a psychedelic experience, it's a less fabricated and less rarefied state than when you're quote unquote sober. <laughs> Once you start to remove the lenses of perception that solidify things, either through a meditation, psychedelics, or self-inquiry, things start to become more psychedelics. Everything started expanding, right? But if you're a jhana junkie or trapped in psychedelic experiences, instead of just letting the conditionings dissolve on their own, you can run into the trouble of piling on more conditionings. But regardless, everything is still the construction of your brain. 
but don't get stuck on a materialistic paradigm of quote unquote everything is the neurons, because the brain also doesn't exist apart from the interconnectedness with everything else. In fact, don't get stuck on any paradigm. The middle way transcends all extremities, right? The Buddha calls that the right view. And you cannot possibly recognize the middle way if you don't have an anatta realization, because the dualistic mind or the center is always going to cling on to an extremity, even if it's very subtle, even if you don't recognize it. In the sutra, they mention four extremes that are dropped with the anatta realization. You are this or that. You drop that. You are not this or that. And you drop that. You are neither this nor that. You are both this and that. And you drop that. Shut the fuck up, let all that go, and just relax, and just be. Emptiness is form. Like, they're one and the same thing. It's not like emptiness vibrates into form, or like form disappears or dissolves into emptiness. There are phases like that. You feel like awareness is shape-shifting into the world. But even that is an illusion, actually. Because if that's still happening, or even like the rising and passing away of sensation into empty space and coming back online, or whatever, there's still some kind of a process in there, but when you completely collapse time, everything is just happening spontaneously, like boom, that's it. And then when you turn your head, boom, a new feel. Like there's no proof that it's the same awareness you're perceiving through the world right now as five minutes ago. Or like this thing called, what is the phase before your grandparents were born? There's no phase between your parents were born. This is the phase, this is the only phase right here, right? A sensation is arising right now because of the webs of conditionality, just like the rainbow. Awareness itself is just another rainbow. The objects are rainbow, awareness is not like a, a perceiving of the rainbow or a source of the rainbow. But then you can't pinpoint one thing and say this is causing that. That's why you shouldn't look at dependent origination as like a linear fashion of cause and effect. Because at the truly non-dual state, the cause and effect becomes one. The cause is the effect. When the right conditionality arises, this arises. When the right conditionality ceases, that ceases. But that's not really a linear process of like A causing B causing C. Sure, on the more relative level of you know, cause and effect, there, there can still exist there. But at the ultimate non-dual perspective, the conditionality really is not something in time. <laughs> so understanding dependent origination, love, emptiness, and the middle way, it's all the same insight. Now, if things come to the existence only through conditionalities and interconnectedness, then nothing stands alone, and nothing has inherent existence apart from this infinite webs or infinite webs of co-creation. It's like this interest net where every point is connected to every other point in the universe and it's connected to itself. Now this is the biggest mindfuck that collapses the biggest duality there is between existence and non-existence. What dependent originates never arose in the first place. Nothing is truly arising, nothing is abiding, and nothing is ceasing either. All well, the holograms are interpenetrating, yet nothing is touching each other. So the more accurate way to describe dependent origination is codependent non-arising. Everything in the virtual reality world is empty, right? It's all constructed, space, time, distance, whatever. But there is an experience, yet nothing is happening. Everything in experience is like the rainbow, is there but not there. But where is this rainbow? When the right conditionality arises, boom, there's the rainbow, there's consciousness. And the next clinical frame of experience is a whole new set of conditionalities that are neither different nor the same as the previous ones, erasing the distinction between separateness and oneness, between continuity and discontinuity. See, there is no consciousness without the object of consciousness and vice versa. Quantum physics started to prove what the Buddha has been talking about for thousands of years with the observer's effect, where things come into existence only through the process of observation and interaction. Otherwise, things exist only in a state of indeterminacy. Yet when all those potentialities come into contact, boom, reality appears. But what is the so-called quantum reality? It's just more waves of potentialities. So it's rainbows all the way down. Is it particle or a wave? Shanless cat is both and neither dead nor alive. In other words, quantum entanglement. A particle on this side of the universe has an effect on a particle on the other side of the universe simultaneously without touching each other. Einstein is like, whoa, that's fucking spooky. But that's actually your direct experience when you reach the deepest part of non-duality, which is non-locality. For... The Buddha calls himself the Tathagata, beyond coming and going. As you can see that there is no thing here. You are therefore located neither in the world of this, nor in the world of that, nor in any place between the two, and this alone is the end of suffering. And because the Tathagata doesn't have a true nature or substance, the world also doesn't have an essence. So there's nothing to cling on to. <laughs> Consciousness is like the fire. For fire to occur in this precise moment, you need the intention of setting something on fire, the contact between the sense organ and the fire, the striking between the mash stick and the mash box. When all these conditionalities occur, the experience of fire occurs. You're beautiful. 
the sound of the drum arisen based on the wood, the stick, and the hide, the sound wave, the ear, and the brain, and the person's effort to make that sound. But where is that sound exactly? The sound of the drum does not dwell in the wood, neither does it dwell in the hide, nor in the stick, nor in the person, nor in the world. But because of these conditionality, there is an experience of quote-unquote sound, yet this sound is completely empty. It has no coming, no going, and no ceasing, and no one to make it arise. And you can apply this to every single sensation and experience in your whole life. Whatever you're upset about will never arisen in the first place. You're still suffering after awakening. You haven't fully grasped the pen origination and emptiness. Whether you're clinging onto a separate self or oneness or awareness, it's all the same thing. You can't put your head anywhere. Another way to describe the non-arising insight is that when you try to find that imaginary point in which something goes from an existence to non-existence, you cannot locate it. Now this insight becomes very clear experientially when the distinction between awareness and sensations, or between consciousness and its content collapses. And if there is no distinction between background and foreground, then where are sensations arising from? Where can it abide in? And where can it go? Now the experience of non-arising can also be called the deathless or the unborn. Now there are actually two ways to experience the unborn and deathless. The first is awareness, being some kind of eternal substrate that is unborn and deathless. Consciousness, being an all-pervasive, unchanging source that gives rise to change. There's still a view in extremity, a craving for being or existence. Now as you wake up out of oneness, you can experience the second kind of deathless, which is the non-rising insight I've been talking about. So you can look at this path as having two major shifts. One is the realization of awareness, and then the realization of emptiness. And then you empty on emptiness by seeing that even emptiness itself is also empty. You can receive insights into dependent origination and emptiness just by practicing the six R's. Because once you let go of any kind of tightening or contractions in experience, you're letting go of more conditionalities. And you apply the six R's, let go of more, until each moment is completely devoid of any substance. And your moment-to-moment -moment experience feels like a permanent cessation merging with infinite consciousness. See, every moment consciousness arises and then collapses onto itself out of the infinite reflections of all the Buddhas being and non-being in all realms. Just like how all the parts of this reality is performing their best symphonies to make this moment an absolute perfection, all past and future lives across all multiverses are penetrating each other, looping from the big band to the big crunch to make this moment shimmering with luminosity that which has no beginning, no middle, and no end. Having realized the three divisions of time to be the same, in a single moment, you see them as indivisible. Eons are condensed into an instant, and an instant opens up into the eons. Billions of worlds fit into one grain of sand. The one is transformed to the many, and the many is transformed to the one.